Singapore works because the majoritarian population gave up its status as a majoritarian population in its language. It accepted that Chinese would not be the national language of Singapore. Professor Chan Heng Chi has many roles, not least of which is ambassador at large for Singapore. And she was in fact Singapore's first female ambassador. Among other things, she is also a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities in the Singapore Institute of Technology and Design. Conversations on the Future focuses on fundamental existential issues beyond the daily news. In this conversation, Professor Chan shares her insights on identity politics, multiracial and multicultural societies, and globalization. I think globalization is part of our DNA. It was there eons ago. The Silk Route was about globalization. Man wandered, you know, and women wandered around. And they, um, you know, went in search of goods. They went in search of the Holy Grail, if I may put it in a different way. Yeah, but they were looking for something. And so you've had these great trade routes set up maritime as well as overland. You can't do away with, with that. But I think the globalization we have seen in the last couple of decades has been hyper-globalization. So much so that everybody is reeling, you know, against what has taken place. And the reactions, the impact is far faster, far more, you know, widespread. It's really very consequential. And all of us, it's not just globalization, it's a technology change, the technology transformation. So globalization and new technologies, disruptive technologies that arrive on the scene, ends up creating serious problems in employment for people. And I think that fuels your search for who am I, what am I, and why am I poor? Why am I not getting a job? You know, is it because of my identity, you know? So I think all this comes together. But let me put it this way. Globalization, it, there is still globalization. I do not believe globalization has disappeared. But the globalization 2.0 or 3.0, whatever you want to call it, is now being revised, amended. It's not so hyper, people think. But globalization is becoming more regionalization. You know, but in the end, there are still searches for this global platform, but there's a greater emphasis on the regional platform, the regional trends and direction. And we are all adjusting. We are just tweaking and adjusting globalization to suit our countries, and rightly so. Singapore is, of course, a remarkable example, perhaps even the most striking example of a truly multiracial society coexisting, succeeding, prospering. And its diversity, its multiracial nature is seen as a competitive advantage. What is the message that Singapore holds in terms of multiracial societies and multicultural societies? I would agree with you. We are one of the more successful multiracial multicultural societies in the world. In fact, visitors who come to Singapore comment that, and my American friends say that they see an absence of the kind of prickliness, an ease of relations, and nobody says you can't go here and you can't go there. And really, pe people are friendly, and the races do uh, sort of walk next to each other and so on. But of course, uh, even in Singapore, you will find that ethnic groups, you know, uh, tend to mingle together a bit more because of foods, because of language and so on. But there's no difficulties in moving out to other groups. Why, you may ask. I would say with multiculturalism and multiracialism, you know, societies that work like Singapore have to keep working at it. it relations have to be managed. Ethnicity and race relations must be managed because some change of forces, change of global events and trends can change things. Race and ethnicity waxes and wanes. We all have identities within us. You know, your race identity, your ethnic identity, you are Indian but Muslim, you know, you are Indian but Hindu, 
you are Chinese and Christian, you are Chinese and Buddhist, you know, there's an amalgam. You're also a woman, you know, you're also an environmentalist, you know, or uh, you're an artist. So we have layers of identity and you activate an identity in a particular context. But trends in the world can make one identity more relevant than the other. We've seen it. Global trends in Islam, you know, in the Muslim community, community, the Ummah, affects Muslims elsewhere, you know. And certainly, you know, that if there is a rise in Christian, uh, you know, religiosity, it can also affect the particular Christian groups. And we've seen it. And increasingly, in recent years, mm. one, the rise of uh, an a self-awareness of that racial group or ethnic community will be contagious. It tends to trigger off the same sense in another group. So I would say multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity in Singapore is something that the political leaders in Singapore pay special attention to and they have to keep managing it. It's not you give up just a given set of laws or regulations. You have to keep tweaking it because there are sensitivities. Singapore works because the majoritarian population gave up its status as a majoritarian population in its language. It accepted that Chinese would not be the national language of Singapore. This is very, very unusual. And I would say that's Lee Kuan Yew's political genius. No other government has been able post-independence to persuade their country to do this. And, you know, and he used uh, the fact that Singapore is in the region. I think minorities forget that the Chinese community gave that up. The majority population gave up something, you know, big. And only that way can we survive in Southeast Asia and we can create this community with English as the lingua, practically the lingua franca. Singapore, I think there are two types of strategies to deal with these multi-racial societies. One is accommodation or integration as a strategy, where you accept every cultural group, they have a right to exist, and you will let them exist and flourish, you know, and you combine it. And you hope at the end of the day, there will be some mixture into something new at the end of the day, but you don't force it. No culture becomes dominant. The different cultures and race groups exist side by side. Then there's assimilation. There's a dominant culture. And you know, group, other groups coming to that culture is expected to integrate or to embrace that dominant culture. France is that way. Everyone is French. France is race blind, color blind, but frankly, it doesn't happen. And I'm not a great fan of that kind of assimilation strategy. If you are race blind and color blind, they don't address the problems. And everyone knows if you walk into the Banlous in France, it's African and Arab. And in fact, some police do not dare to enter some Banlous. It's so hostile to their outside culture and you still have population segments that feel alienated, you know, and rejected by society. And I think the Charlie Hebdo incident in France showed that there was this existing, you know, lack of integration. Now, around the world, we have more identity politics in Asia as well as in the West, where we see right-wing political parties rising and associated with that anti-immigration sentiment rising. Uh, on top of that, or underlying that, we have weather volatility induced in many cases by global warming. We have a biodiversity crisis and we have a war in Europe. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on the direction of human society and institutions in this very volatile political and environmental time we are on the cusp of. You are right. All is not right in the world, you know. In fact, Thaman Shamugaratnam, our senior minister, said that, that we are facing a perfect long storm, the world is, at this moment. You know, it is a pandemic crisis. 
which has led to an economic crisis for most countries. You see inflation, and there is a climate crisis, really, which is catastrophic and you know, env enveloping all of us. Now, I think in this context, we have seen also arising over years now, you know, identity politics, which really had its full bloom in the United States. And of course, whatever happens in the United States is viewed by the rest of the world, and somehow it trickles through and infects the rest of the world in some dimension a few years later. You know, and identity politics in uh, the U.S. really, I think, began with this very long simmering non-resolution of the African American integration, full integration into American society. You know, it's um, how uh, African Americans, I think, feel that they have not enjoyed the same kind of equal rights and have to keep fighting for it in different states, you know, even though the Constitution um, spells it out, and that America has voted for an African-American politician in uh, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama. But in spite of that, you read about stories all the time of, you know, cases where, you know, blacks are targeted and, you know, African-Americans are targeted and they feel they receive the brunt of a brutality, you know, police brutality. So I think because of that, identity politics has become a hallmark, has become uh, very strong with the African American community. You, long ago, they already expressed black power, you know, so identity politics is the non resolved aspect of that emerging as identity politics. And uh, it's the layers of crisis upon crisis in the community. Uh, now, this identity politics has emerged now, particularly with what is happening globalization, because it infects others, with the rise of the identity politics of the African American community, it triggers off a same sense of search for identity and assertion of identity in the Hispanic community. Asian Americans, you know, now it's Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, you know. Then what happens? You have the white community also say, hey, but there's me, you know. I'm a white male, poor, and I'm not doing as well. So you have social identity politics emerging. It's, um, in a way, is it ideological? I kind of feel that identity politics has become a new sort of ideological politics in America. But with this, it's a reaction to you know, the rise of other identities, putting pressure, and you want a claim of a share of what's available. But it's also globalization, the technology disruption, you know, where jobs are lost through automation and so on. And people searching for answers turn to identity. As they say, globalization, the other side of globalization, the other face of globalization is localization. And I might even say tribalization, you know. So I, I see that, you know. And it spawns also right-wing movements, you know. And uh, this whole identity politics, it gives rise also to nationalism, and certainly strong religious identities too. And you know, you know, you know that in India, the push for a Hindu Rashtra by 2025 is now out there. So I think you can see this, not just in India, but you know, not just in America, America first, and they have different forms, you know, and the Chinese have become more nationalistic, you know, so I think identity politics is very much with us. But let me say, when groups that you know, um, mobilize behind identity do it in the name of democracy and seeking a place and for themselves, seeking for their rights and allocation of rights to themselves. But I feel paradoxically, identity politics does not 
help democracy because it is a single issue orientation and democracy makes it necessary to compromise and to work with others. And in identity politics, by and large, you know, there's much less working together. And you can see this in the United States. What is your advice to the younger generation, general, uh, Generation Z, which is, you know, late teens, the median age is late teens at the moment. They're sort of coming into a world um, which is uh, full of uncertainty, full of, still full of possibilities. And going back to the beginning of our conversation on multiracialism and multiculturalism and the globalization, of course, what is your advice to the younger generation, that generation, in terms of the world they're going to inhabit and how to deal with it? I'd like to leave a positive message, but let me um, put it in this way. And uh, I'll address Singaporeans first, but it is also relevant globally. You know, in Singapore, as elsewhere, Britain, you know, the US, you will find today that actually there are far greater inter-ethnic marriages and transnational marriages than ever before. You know, in Singapore, the numbers are quite staggering. Pre-pandemic, we had 90 to 20 percent of Singapore marriages that are interracial and interethnic, about 20%. During the pandemic, it dropped to 16.2%, far fewer marriages too, and so on. And also the transnational marriages, which were at a high of 37%, 35-37% in Singapore. Of all the marriages, you know, imagine that more than a third, you know, were transnational. During the pandemic, because of border restrictions, nobody could travel. The transnational marriages also reduced, you know, to about 29%, less than 30%. Now, this is a trend. What happens to society? This happens in Britain too. And they have, in Britain, there is an emerging mixed group, people who feel that they have a mixed group identity. And here in Singapore, you hear people saying, you know, CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others as a paradigm, uh, the right paradigm. Who am I? You know, what is my identity? And so you are growing in a society that is much, the boundaries, shall we say, are much less fixed, is more flexible. But sociologists studying mixed groups now in Britain, I just read a study, showed that whilst, you know, young people identify themselves, see mixed group. The mixed group has a very different idea of mix in each person's mind. You don't feel, think of it in the same way. And it is not a distinct group. There are different mixes. And I think the same in Singapore. You know, we allow hyphenated uh, entries into race. Malay Chinese, Indian Chinese, uh, Indian Malay, Eurasian Chinese, you know. But uh, not a lot of people activate that hyphenated category. And uh, sometimes they uh, integrate into the larger community. So my advice is, first, in terms of identity and what goes forward, I think you, one should learn tolerance and acceptance, and that borders are fluid. My advice to leaders is pay attention to your society. You have to work at it and get at the grievances before the grievances get to the stage where it becomes identity politics. Can you decelerate? I'm not sure, you know. Uh, and I don't have the answer, Namal, of what will actually cause a deceleration in identity politics. Maybe a great catastrophe, you know, in climate change, a great catastrophe, which I hope never happens, some kind of war, that really silences a lot of things and you come together as a group. But I hope that it doesn't happen that way. That will, you know, uh, I think mitigate the sort of uh, rise and rise and rise of identity politics, you know. But I think young people also have to deal with the concerns and anxieties of technology transformation, and that is real. So I would say that really 
be tolerant, be open, get a good education and some domain expertise, but work for the good because working for a good and a sense of mission, you know, is much more rewarding than just turning to yourself, have a purpose larger than yourself. Okay, fascinating. Professor Chan Hanchi, thank you so much. Always fascinating to hear you and thank you for coming on to Conversations on the Future. Thank you.